As mentioned, uh, my name is Larissa and I'm here from Toronto Public Library. Uh, I will start off by saying I am by no means a tech person, a Linux expert or anything like that. We, I am just sort of starting to get into this world and it's a big, big world and I'm loving it so far. But just wanted to put that disclaimer out there right from the beginning, so not an expert by any means. Um, but we do have this new initiative at uh, Toronto Public Library called Let's Learn Tech. So we have partnered with uh, Cisco Networking Academy to offer a few online courses that start to go more into the tech side of things rather than our traditional user education courses, which were Microsoft Word, PowerPoint, things like that, very basic digital literacy competencies. Um, so we launched Let's Learn Tech back in March of last year, online only. So we started out with uh, the Let's Learn Tech online so we offered three courses. They are self-enrolled, self-directed learning, and each course is available for nine weeks. With before the end of the nine-week period, though, we launch a new iteration of the course two weeks before it ends, so that there's constantly a stream of courses going through. So if either you don't get a chance to complete a course before its end date, or you just you started too late, there's always another session of the same course going on. And you don't have to, like it's not that when you go through the content, you have to pick up from where you left off. You can go to wherever you want in the course, so you can move around as well. So that launched last March, as I said. Uh, the three courses that we offered, Introduction to IoT, Introduction to Cybersecurity, and of course, the Linux Unhatched. Is anyone here familiar with the NDG Linux Unhatched course? No? So what it is, it is an eight hour course. Eight hours online and it's 19 basic Linux commands. It's super, super basic. It doesn't go in depth really into anything, but it gives you a little bit of a sense of here's what a command, here's the command line interface and what it can do. Here is how you put in a command. Here is how it reacts with this. So it just gives you a little sense of all the different packages that are there. It's not enough to actually teach you how to use it properly, but it's enough for someone who's interested in just learning about Linux and saying, hey, you know what, I've heard about this thing, not quite sure what it is, thought I'd give it a go. Maybe I worked with DOS back in the day and I heard that there are some similarities to it. Whatever the case may be, it's enough to give you a sense of, I run through it, it's only a few hours, not too, much, not too time consuming, but is this for me, is this something that I'm interested in doing? So our partners, so Cisco Networking Academy, of course, they provide the platform that the courses run on. We are bound to their platform currently. So uh, whatever course content comes out, we, it's through theirs. So any um, iterations of it come directly from them. We do not put the course materials together ourselves, unfortunately, yet maybe, I don't know, maybe in the future. Uh, P2PU, does anyone know who P2PU is? So P2PU stands for Peer-to-Peer -peer University. What it is, is it's an on, it, they were started online and they have developed this model which is referred to as the learning circle model. So what it is, is it's taking online courses and running them in a non-traditional classroom setting. So they wanted to, they looked at the traditional classroom model of student teacher. They looked at the online platform where people are just going and it's all self-directed learning. And they said, you know, this is good for some, this is good for others, but how can we take this huge, vast world of online content and help people to get through it? Because I don't know how many of you usually do online courses or have run through any of them, but completion rates are super, super low in comparison to a traditional classroom setting. So what Peer-to-Peer -peer University did is they came up with this model, which is the learning circle model, where the instructors come together, or sorry, not instructors, Facilitators will take content and it's a peer learning environment. So a bunch of people will say, hey, we're all interested in learning some Linux, but none of us are experts. None of us really have an idea what we're doing. There are courses available though. So we're gonna work through the course content together and then hopefully it'll improve our success rate. I have a, time, a date and time and place where I'm gonna meet every week or every twice a week. We did, one, we did ours twice a week. And then I know it's part of my schedule, it's part of my routine, I'm more likely to go. If I get stuck, because I don't know how many of you have done an online course, but inevitably, there's always that point where you get to in a course and you go, shoot, 
I'm stuck here. There's this thing I just can't get over. There's a concept I don't quite understand, and I'm going back, and I'm a little stuck. Well, in a classroom environment, when you've got your peers with you, they can help you work through those issues. So that's what the learning circle model is. It's basically taking all those online courses, bringing them together in a friendly uh, environment where you're learning together with your peers. There is no expert instructor, but everyone is just learning together. So that's what that model is. And then George Brown College, they are our tech support center for our Cisco Networking Academy. And they do provide support for us. So again, the learning circles, it's online learning, face-to-face, -face, and it's in favor of peer-to-peer -peer learning. So again, instead of that traditional teacher-student model, we are all learning together as our peers. So there is a facilitator in each session. Um, so for our sessions, like we have a group of us that we will be the facilitator. So our responsibility is basically to review the course content, sort of break it down into sections, um, and Maybe we will go over the course content in advance, but we are not subject matter experts. But we will assist in helping with discussion, conversations, and pulling information out of people. So if we get stuck on something and people have a question, so rather than, oh, Larissa, I have a question. Can you tell me what the answer is? I'm going to throw it back to the group. Say, well, can anyone else in the group? Who else is having this difficulty? Or can someone shed some light on this? Does anyone have any experience in this? And I can tell you from the circles that we've done, is we get a range of experience from someone who is just new to being proficient with using a computer, never mind any of the tech heavy stuff, but just using a computer, to people who have a programming background, who worked, have worked in, in IT for years, which is always surprising to me that when we run these introductory courses, I get people who actually have IT backgrounds. I'm like, why? It, it blows my mind, but it's because there's so much out there and it's so rapidly changing. A lot of times people have also been removed from uh, the IT world for a number of years and they said, you know what, I stepped out, did something else, maybe I uh, you know, traveled the world, maybe I had a kid, maybe I did something else and then I tried to step back in and I realized that the tech all surpassed my knowledge. All of a sudden, something I was proficient in, I'm no longer. So they'll come back and just sort of refresh with a lot of our courses. So here's this, few shots of how we run our circles. So with the learning circle, we really try to create a non-classroom setting. So we try not to have rows, not to have a big screen at the front like this, <laughs> with one person standing up and preaching to the masses. It's more, we really try and make it like a circle. At the beginning of each session, we do a check-in. So at the beginning of each session, in one of my, at the beginning of my circles, I always have people have name tags, so everyone has their name. And at the beginning of each session, we do a check-in and say, hey, so today what I'd like you to do is I'd like you to state your name and why you decided to take this course or what you, what you expect to learn for ten, from today, something you want to get out of it. I may start a session like that. If I have a Friday session, I may say, state your name and something you're looking forward to this weekend so that there's also just that community aspect of it where it's a peer friendly environment and it's not all course heavy and course specific. So these are just a few of the circles that we've had so far, people busily working away on their computers, lots of fun. Um, so that was our pilot learning circle that we did. That was on um, introduction to IoT. So some of the lessons we took from that, smaller groups work better, as I'm sure you can imagine for something like that. Um, my particular group, I had 16 learners and found that it was way too much, especially because the level of uh, competencies was, it ranged so drastically and you really can't prepare for that, that if there were too many people having trouble, I had to assist them with general computer tech stuff rather than helping people to engage in conversation in the course. So we found about eight to 12 is about the sweet spot, perfect size for a classroom. Um, we found social interactions were very, very important. We, um, a lot of the people in my class especially, they created their own little social networks. They are all still in contact with one another. They created their own online group and they have their own little meetups now that all came from out of this. Um, also, we ran a survey at the end and we had a lot of people respond saying that it helped contribute to their sense of social inclusion and made them feel more like they were a part of this community and not so far removed. And because they were entering into something that may have been new and they were learning together with others, 
it wasn't as daunting for them. So the social interaction was really important. Peer support was crucial. So again, when they, people hit that wall, they found, you know, I was really struggling. If I didn't have my buddy over here to help me get through this, I don't know if I would have gotten through that course. So they really helped each other out and helped each other to finish. And some of the and this happened organically. I was amazed. Some of the stronger people in the course and the not as strong people in the course ended up sort of partnering up with one another. And the more experienced people started helping out the people who weren't as advanced. Naturally, didn't have to say a word to them, didn't have to um, suggest that this would be something they should do. They naturally just did it because they were like, hey, you know what, we're all friends here and we want to make sure that everyone is getting everything they can out of this course. And overall, we found the model was successful. So people liked it. Um, I think of, of our survey respondents, every single person said that they'd recommend this, uh, this type of model to their friends. So that led us to Linux Unhatched. So as I said, our first learning circle was introduction to IoT. Um, and then for the month of February, we ran Linux Unhatched, which is that eight hour course at six branches across the city using that learning circle model. Now I will tell you, with whatever the courses say online on our website for the, if you're doing the self-directed learning, whatever the time frame they gave us was, we doubled if we were doing it as a learning circle. Because there is discussion, there is more review. A lot of people take notes and take very thorough notes, so it takes a lot more time. So we took the eight hours, we doubled it to 16. We met twice a week for two hours over the course of four weeks in February to get through our Linux courses. So the branches we ran it at, are we're Agent Court, Albert Campbell, Cedarbury, Downsview, Lillian H. Smith, and Northern District. So we also tried to spread it out across the city. Uh, I will tell you there are three people, myself included, in um, the Toronto, at Toronto Public Library who are running these right now. Three of us across the whole city of 100 branches. There are three. So we each ran two circles. We're working on the train the trainer model. So what we're doing is we're taking it to whatever branches are interested. So I threw out a call to people and said, hey, if you guys are interested, let me know. We can come and we can run this course um, at your branch and have a staff member sit in, shadow the program, possibly facilitate one of the sessions so that they can get a sense of, okay, now I know what the course content is. I've seen how this, the learning circle model works and I've actually had the chance to facilitate a session now I'm ready to take the course and run another session of it. So we're hoping that these branches now are going to start running their own sessions and we can now move on to new branches and start running the program there. So some of the survey findings from that, um, we had 71% of the people in it say that this was the first online course that they had ever done. And we had a completion rate of almost 80%. So almost 80% of the people that came in and signed up finished the course and completed it and got their certificate of completion. Not a certification, I know, we all know that, but at least they got something saying, hey, you know what? I signed up for this and I finished it and I did it. And from that, uh, we also found that we've, the course provided access to technology that people would not otherwise have had access to. This was a big shocker. 81% of the people who we surveyed after the, at the end of the courses said that this particular course provided them access to technology they would not otherwise have had access to by coming and doing the course at the library. Um, I really didn't expect it to be that high. So it really just goes to show um, what we can do. Um, so it helped improve digital skills and increase comfort level with technology. So we had 93% of people said it helped them feel more comfortable using technology and just get over that apprehension. And 100% of, of the learners said they'd recommend the program to others. And we found that the demand is high for more advanced programs. So they were asking for more, um, they wanted coding programs, they wanted the more cybersecurity. And of course, they asked for the Linux Essentials. So this course was not ori originally on our roster of courses, our three basic courses. As I mentioned, we only launched in March of last year. Um, so we were actually planning on launching some of the more advanced courses um, 
later on this year, but because of the strong, strong feedback that we had from the participants of the Unhatched group, we actually ended up putting the course together. I mean, as I said, Cisco puts the course together, so all we have to do is sort of tailor it to our needs and then launch it online. So it's not too time consuming. <laughs> it's not like we created a course. But because of that, we actually launched it as soon as the Linux Unhatched Learning Circles ended. We had the Linux Essentials available online. Um, and I actually know for a fact that a bunch of the people from that course have been working through the Linux Essentials course. And some of the people from my learning circle, from the Unhatched Learning Circle, are almost finished the course. And I know this because I get all the uh, information anytime people complete certain levels. So I can actually see and see the metrics of the people who just went into this sort of out of curiosity. And I've now almost completed the Essentials course, which is the 70 hour course. So um, that's pretty much in a nutshell where we've come from. Um, so if you have any questions, I am more than happy to answer them. Uh, who's actually teaching these courses? So again, it's the learning circle model. So it's not a teacher, it's a facilitator. So currently, so the online platform is self-directed learning. Um, the three of us that do oversee the courses are the contact people for if people run into issues or have any uh, queries. We are the people that they would come to. And for the learning circles, we're the ones running the learning circle. So me and my team, the three of us across the city. How busy do they keep you during a session? Like, is it most of it focused on the screen, or do they get frequently stuck with something silly and, or something difficult and get you to help, and, or, do they, or is it a communal help thing? You know what? It really, really depends on the group. So I had two very different groups. I ran the group at Lillian H. Smith and the one at Albert Campbell. So opposite ends of the city, totally different demographics, totally different group of people, and the group at Lillian Smith most of them had a fairly extensive tech background. So they actually took a lot of the course content and then went, okay, so I understand how this works. Now what happens if we do this and would start to actually fiddle around with it, which is what you want them to do. You want them to experiment and say, okay, so now that you understand the basic principles, what does that mean for other things? And they would fool around with it and throw out higher echelon questions that I was like, I have no idea. But but then work through them together, which was great. Whereas the other group would get stuck a bit more on, okay, so I'm having issues understanding this concept. Can we go over this again? And can we go over why? So for the most part though, any of the questions that did come up were very discussion based and not so much I'm stuck on something on the screen. As I said, the course itself is very basic level. So there wasn't anything super complicated on there that anyone got really stuck on. I found, in all honesty, probably the biggest barrier for anyone would have been either um, computer literacy in general, English literacy, so just or tech jargon. Those would, be, would have been the biggest barriers, probably. So not necessarily understanding the concepts, but maybe the terminology or the language used. Before you went to the learning circles, what kind of course completion rates were you getting? Ah, very good question. So I can tell you they're at around 5% completion rate for the online only courses, in and around 5%. I can also tell you from one of, from the uh, IOT course that we did, which was our first one that where we used the learning circle model, we had three different uh, demographic groups. So we had youth, we had, um, uh, adults uh, with young children and then we had older adults and the older adults actually had the highest completion rate at 88 percent so my question is what factors led to Linux being chosen as one of these uh, uh, targets was it something that folks were asking for or is it something that was pushed by a, a special interest group ah, good question um, it was a combination of a number of factors. Mainly, well, first of all, the courses that were available on the Cisco platform, because as I mentioned, we're bound to that platform. So that was one of the things. We also wanted to try and choose a number of courses. So people had been asking for a lot of um, courses that dealt more with 
programming aspects with operating systems and things like that. So that's where that came from. Um, I know like with coding, we couldn't offer a lot of the basic coding ones just because they were too advanced. So we thought, well, let's go to an OS instead. So open source was a big thing at the time as well, big, big discussion, lots of people coming in and asking about it as well as privacy, um, which is where the cybersecurity came out of. So we wanted to start with things that were at an entry level, first of all, and then also ones that had the potential to be built upon and ones that were feasible to run in the library setting. So a number of factors. Did you find these groups actually wanted to continue as a group after the session? Absolutely. Uh, one of the big things they said is everyone said, can you do Linux Essentials as a learning circle? And we all went, oh my god, I don't know if we can. Now, I can tell you, um, do many of you know Evan? Yes. 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 So, yes. Evan and I, um, well, Evan and my team and I, uh, have been in discussion, also with Nico, who is from Peer to Peer University, um, in, and we've been discussing the potential of collaborating to put something together exactly for that, to try and run the essentials in that type of model. So we are actually talking to Evan about that and seeing if there is a way that we can put that together because absolutely, as soon as we, we launched the essentials right after the unhatched learning circles and people said, this is great, but I don't think I can complete it online on my own, so can you run the essentials as a learning circle? So we're looking into the feasibility of that. Um, hopefully we'll at least get something out of it. So, yeah. A follow-up to make my question clear. I meant the actual groups that formed, did they cohere in a way that they, they individually wanted to meet with the same group and continue the process? Ah, um, not that I know of. I know that they do still meet on their own for social reasons. So, um, but in terms of them coming to me and saying, we want this group to continue in this fashion, I, I don't know. Hi, uh, another thought. Um, are you actively looking for people to run to, to help out with programs like that? Or what, I, I'm asking this question partially because I'm a certified engineering technologist and we're supposed to do continuing professional development. And the professional engineers have been hit with that one too. Um, we are, again, as I said, so we're looking into what we can do, what we are allowed to do in terms of um, what our union allows, what the library system allows, uh, what our partnership agreements allow. Um, but we, it is something that we are looking into to see if we could bring in people who would um, assist with delivering some of this type of programming. Thank you. For um, more advanced courses, have you tried uh, things like software carpentry or ladies learning code? I think they have uh, materials for, for example, learning command line or learning some programming or using Git. And they basically have all the materials available. You just kind of can use them. Not yet. <laughs> we're still, as I said, we're only a year into this initiative and it is meant to be um, a growing initiative. So it's something that is meant, it's not just a, hey, we're doing this for a year or two and now we're quitting. Um, it will be something that would be built upon. Um, so maybe we can talk after and you can give me some information about some of those courses and we can look into it. We're, we're very experimental right now and we are open to suggestions and anything that you guys have to offer would be greatly appreciated. Were the Cisco courses designed to be in a learning circle or are you? Good question. No, the, so the Cisco courses were designed to be online learning and online only. Um, and actually, Evan came to um, three of our sessions. So, and our, I will tell you, our learners loved him, just adored him. They're like, that guy was the best. You should bring him every time. Because I let them know, okay, he's coming, so bring your questions in advance. And they came up with, they actually stumped him on one. I wish I remember what it was. But they, he was like, I actually don't know the answer to this. And I was like, oh. But, um, yeah, so, sorry, totally lost my train of thought. I do that sometimes. So Evan did come into some of the, the learning circle sessions um, to talk about um, what other types of things there were. 
Um, totally lost what I was saying. Where was I going with this? I'll ask that question again. Sure. <laughs> Um, no, I just wondered if the courses had been tailored for learning circles right. because it seems to me just from a pedagogical standpoint, you might have a different kind of a course if you knew it was for, to be delivered through learning right, circles. Right, right. So that's where I was going with that. So one of Evan's main comments from observing the courses was he was saying, it's great, love what you guys are doing. However, the course wasn't really designed for this, and it wasn't. They were designed for an online learning platform. They were designed for a, I'm sitting in front of my computer and going through the process and I'm doing it on my own. That's what the courses were designed to be. So we've taken that and tried to incorporate another method of learning into that. So one of the things that Evan and Nico from Peer to Peer University are looking at is creating a course that is Linux based, that is developed specifically with the learning circle model in mind. So that is something that is being looked at and worked on. Uh, you may have actually just answered the question, uh, but my question was, does like uh, uh, P2PU or, or Cisco get feedback from you to change the courses or, or, or make the courses better? Yes, okay, so Peer-to-Peer -peer University, they are mainly our training support center. They have their own courses um, online as well. But they're not, peer-to-peer -peer university doesn't create the courses. They create the forum and the training resources on how do I run the circles and what are some good pra best practices. So peer-to-peer -peer doesn't actually create the courses. The ones that Cisco creates, we as instructors, instructors, I'll use the air quotes for that one, um, we can provide them with feedback. So also at the end of any of the Cisco courses, there is a feedback form that, that the students submit that the learners submit, and they can't get their certificate of completion until they complete that. So that's because Cisco wants feedback on how are these courses working? Are we giving you what you need? Are there things that need to be changed? And then we have the ability to write into them and say, hey, we noticed you know, this doesn't work so well. This needs to be updated. This information is wrong. Um, I was doing a lab with one of my um, courses. I'm doing another IoT course currently, and we use Packet Tracer. And one of the labs has two instructions on Packet Tracer in reverse order. So if you, don't, if you try and do them, you can't complete the lab if you follow the order that it's presented in because it's wrong. So things like that, we can provide them with feedback and course corrections and say, hey, you know, this is what, this is what, we're, uh, we're, what we noticed is wrong with this one. Or, you know, is there any way to update this? Um, I'm actually going to be attending their annual conference uh, in May where you meet a bunch of instructors and you meet the people, but we are always in contact with them. And, as, and so if there are any issues that arise, we can provide them with that kind of feedback. They also do send us surveys every so often to check in on our progress, things that we've found, what's working for us and what's not. So out of curiosity, during the talk, I signed up for the online version of Linux Dunhatch because I was kind of curious as to what was in it and I noticed it had a certain limitation where for it to work correctly, you can't be on mobile or tablet. You actually need a proper computer. But so with the learning circles with more people there, but has it ever come up where people have actually uh, come with only mobile device and not been able to do stuff and to instead worked as a pair with someone who actually uh, so for our learning circles, we've done them all in computer labs. So we've made certain that there's a computer a desktop available for, or a laptop, depending on which, uh, which branch we're working out of. But we've made sure that there's one available to use. Um, there is also, I can tell you also, that because they load in a VM to, um, yeah. for the CLI, um, because it's loaded in on the platform, it doesn't run properly in older browsers. Um, it doesn't. Work. <laughs> it works best in Google Chrome. I can tell you this. So all sorts of little things, which I'm sure you're all pretty familiar <laughs> with, running into these types of problems. Um, but yeah, so that is that is definitely a factor. People do have issues, but we always make sure that however many people we have registered, we've ensured that we can at least provide the resources for them to do the course in the classroom setting. So what's going to happen when you expand out to things like College Shaw, where you don't have those sorts of labs? We are working on getting what we're calling mini tech hubs, 
which is basically 10 laptops that can travel. So we're working on it. It is a work in progress. Also, I should mention, because I know I heard someone mention about a Raspberry Pi workshop that's coming. We are also working on the Raspberry Pi lending program. So you should see that in the Toronto Public Library branches sometime before the end of the year where you can actually sign out and borrow a Raspberry Pi. So <laughs> just a neat little thing, something that's coming. Any other questions? So you've had very good luck with the learning circles. We uh, have. Process adapting a course that was intended to be run, uh, a facts and skills course that was intended to be run interactively. How do you think it would fit uh, a, a course where, there, where it was originally basically half an hour lecture and, and a longish lab? Could you recast a course into a learning circle that was, that was set up that way? Because several of my, uh, several of my uh, industrial courses were designed for that original form. We could. Um, I, I don't see why that wouldn't be a possibility. Uh, the thing is, right now, we're really focused on that interaction and the face-to-face -face portion of it as, I mean, that is the main sort of heart and soul of the learning circle model is that face-to-face -face interaction and that peer-to-peer -peer, um, coordination. How big is the, the biggest group that you can reasonably handle at one sitting? So I had, my biggest group that I had was 16. As I said, it was too much, but only too much because by the end of the day I was spent and exhausted. It wasn't that it was not doable, it was that to do that amount of, to have that amount of people in one class where you're meeting twice a week for two hours all the time, if I'd had an assistant in the room just so that if someone is having an issue like with just a regular tech issue, or if we're having Wi-Fi issues, that was a big one. We had Wi-Fi issues in the room that I was using. We found that after a certain period of time in the day, half the laptops would drop off the network. Yeah, it was awesome. Not, but yeah. So if I'd had someone there just to troubleshoot those little things, would have worked out much better. But we found about um, 12 is perfect. With respect to that uh, size question, if you look at the uh, maximum size of sports teams. Mm -hmm. The largest common one you'll find, I think, is rugby union, which is, has 15 people, and that has certain specialized roles. Typically, it's around 11 to 12. I would suggest that the, the largest effective human unit in normal purposes is the coven, 13 people. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, I, I understand that uh, people have done some, some research on uh, social circles and the problem is the combinatorial explosion of the possible relationships once you get to 15 it becomes it becomes oh it basically makes people's brains explode and that's that's too much to it well i also found with my bigger group um the group divided itself into subgroups whereas with um i had another group one of my linux groups was 13 and they stayed as a cohesive unit so it definitely, once we got in and about, and it was 16, so right in and around that 15, they started to divide. Not that, any, not that there was any animosity between the groups, but they just kind of subdivided themselves into two halves. It was very interesting. Hi. Was that acceptable? So, oh, sorry. <laughs> All right, go ahead. So about uh, with your future mobile packs of laptops, any of them going to go on, say, bookmobile trips to unconventional places like senior centers? It's possible. Um, I can't say for certain. There are always things that are in the works. Um, that is a great suggestion, though. What I would suggest is if you go into any of your local branches and fill out a customer feedback form and suggest, I'm not kidding. It is a great way to get your ideas heard because people can, like, we have, the staff have tons of input and tons of ideas. Public has tons of input and tons of ideas. So the more times that the administration hears, people are asking for this, people are asking for this, and I saw it from this end of the city and this end of the city, they start to say, hey, maybe there's something to this. So I do recommend, like if you have a suggestion and something you feel strongly about that you think could work, 
please go into your local branch and fill out a feedback form. Yeah, I mean, I, you, I work near what used to be a bookmobile stop, so. There you go. <laughs> I'll, I'll echo that, and I promise to go in and suggest it, because my father-in-law took up computers as, as when he was older than I, than I was at the time and was absolutely brilliant at it. Wonderful. Is there merit to some of us well, wandering in a little bit like Evan and um, in theory helping out with, uh, with some of these learning circles or is there a lot of risk of us being the uh, well, oh well, we're those we're those condescending Unix guys that no. know too much. Absolutely the opposite. I will tell you, the people that have been signing up for these courses are people who are really interested in the content and really have a, like and really do appreciate expertise. Some of the feedback that we got from the unhatched circles in the first round was loved the guest speaker. Please have one subject matter expert in each circle. So there would ab Guys, we've got circles coming up. We're doing uh, June, July, August circles. If uh, that's something that some of you may want to like talk to me about and maybe come in and provide some expertise in a session, I'd be more than happy to have you come in. Yeah, it worked really well last time. They really, really appreciated it. Um, I'm just curious. I, I missed the, the talk. That's okay. Uh, is it mainly just beginners, right? They're, Yes, as absolute beginners. Well, absolute beginners in Linux, not necessarily absolute beginners in IT. Okay. So I, I was telling the group, I had a lot of people who had careers in IT maybe 20 years ago who worked in DOS or who were programmers. So just new to Linux, but not new to the IT world. Okay. And second question, um, are you, are you going to give more advanced courses or like yes. programming? So we're looking into, so um, as I said, so we just launched the Linux Essentials um, this month and we'll be launching more advanced courses by the end of the year. So you'll see Python coming out soon. Um, other ones, I'm not sure what else we're looking into. Um, some of the, um, um, what are they calling it now, technopreneur courses? Is that, what the, is that the term that they're using it? Uh, it's, it's awful. I read it and I was like... But anyway, so some of the entrepreneurial courses, um, I know, it's a terrible, terrible word. But um, we, are, we are definitely looking into it. And we're looking to continually add content as well. So because the online courses, as I mentioned, we, each course is up for nine weeks. Now, we just launched the essentials, as I said, this month. So we're going to see at the end if the nine-week period is long enough. We may extend that one because it is a huge course. Um, but we will be launching other more advanced courses as well, and we'll just be adding to the content. So we're not pulling anything that's already there. We'll be continually adding to it and launching new. So you probably missed at the beginning as well. When we have our courses, they're up, as I said, they're up for nine weeks. And two weeks before the end of the current course, we release another iteration of it. So they're always overlapping so that there's always a course running for people to sign up on. Oh, I have one more question. Um, you said uh, that um, uh, your Linux, Linux course was uh, led into by IoT, and I strongly suspect IoT is probably running Linux underneath whatever IoT device you're using. So could you talk a little bit about how the IoT course started? Is there anything that is similar to the Linux course and things like that? Um, there's not really much. It was more... In all honesty, Cisco has sort of a progression that they recommend, and that was the order that they dictated, if that they suggested to us. You know, if you're starting and if you're looking, and there was a lot of conversations with our organization and with Cisco and with consultation with the public of what they were asking for of what is the best, and it really just came out of that. It wasn't so much that the course content led from one into the other. I mean, the Linux, the Linux and Hatch obviously led into the Linux Essentials, um, but other than that, it doesn't really touch too much on it. It's more, as I said, they counted it as sort of a stepping stone, and that was the progression that they, that Cisco felt was appropriate. Uh, following on to the IoT talk, mm -hmm. uh, that is an incredibly broad subject matter. 
even more than what the unhatched would cover with just 16 Linux commands. What did that course actually contain? Okay, so the IoT course is a 20 hour, I'm gonna use air quotes again, 20 hour course. We, there are six chapters and we ran it in a branch for nine weeks, twice a week, um, for two hours. And we cut out chapter six altogether. So that's first of all a sense of how much time it takes to go through. Also, to be quite honest, chapter six is more the what can you do and what is Cisco offering in terms of IoT? So we just suggested, you know, if you are interested, please research this on your own. But it wasn't so much IoT content as what can I do with this now in terms of what Cisco is offering. Um, but they started, so there is, so we work in Packet Tracer for our virtual server environment. So there is a bit of uh, cabling, connecting, routers, switches, um, actuators, things like that. There is the smart home. So um, connecting devices through a smart home in the in Packet Tracer, so in the virtual platform. There's a little bit of coding, so there's a bit of Python, so there's a, an element of Python in that. There's an element of cybersecurity. There is, I'm trying to think of what else there is. It's just, it's huge. And again, it's not really enough to go thoroughly in depth into any one thing, but it gives you a taste of a little bit of this, a little bit of that. and. And from that, you can actually say, okay, you know what? I really liked the Python part of this. And we use, um, we did some of the, we did a Raspberry Pi workshop using Blockly and the end Python script into that. So, and people really liked that. So some of the people said, you know what? This is the part of the course that I found interesting and that worked for me. So now I'm gonna expand into, into that area of things. Whereas other people have said, you know what, cybersecurity is awesome. I really enjoyed that section. Now I'm going to go and take the cybersecurity course. So there are really little bits and pieces of everything. The first chapter is kind of all, how are things connected? How do they work? It talks about different types of networks, um, how things connect to one another, how things gather data, sensors, things like that. Um, there is also a huge section on data management, just how it, everything is housed, how to aggregate it, how everything's broken down. Um, yeah, there's a little bit of everything. It's, it's an interesting course. I actually think it's a lot of fun because of the fact that it doesn't focus on one particular thing. You're constantly jumping from one thing to the next. And I find that interesting. Some people find that frustrating. So it really depends on, on what you're looking for. So I would have thought the hardest problem for something in this direction is recruiting people into it. because People don't know that, that they can learn something. They're scared of it. They don't know what's interesting and so on. You you sound like you've done enough recruiting to fill up your courses. And, and the next problem, I would think, would be sort of getting those people inertia to go, or momentum to go on to other courses and related things. You don't have a large suite. Um, you just touched on. Yeah where people could go from your courses. Do you see any, any way of creating paths for people into things that you can't supply? I mean, you can't, we, with luck, you can't supply yeah. all, your, all the demand. It'd be great if we could. <laughs> no, I mean, like you create enough demand that it's beyond your capacity. Yeah. What, what do you think about um, so, on-ramps to other things or whatever you we, want to call them. So first of all, anyone that uh, registers for one of our classes has to create an account through um, the Cisco Net Networking Academy. So once they're in the academy, they have access to their full suite of courses. So it doesn't necessarily have to go through. We do often have people asking, okay, so what's my next step now? And we can give them advice and say, you know, maybe we're not running this, but here is what is next beyond that. Here is here are the next um, iterations of that. We've had some people, um, and because we have our partnership or our, with George Brown as well as our tech support center, and they of course offer a whole suite of courses. A lot of people have asked, you know, what are the are there any college courses available? So we just we know what George Brown offers. We also know what Seneca offers. Just <laughs> and and we'll say, you know, it depends on what you're looking at, what what you're looking into. So we, we do know what other courses are out there and we do have ways of directing people to them where the, when there is interest. We also, for all of our learning circles, we've grouped them into, so on the NetAcad platform, 
as an instructor, every person that signs up for a certain course is put into that classroom. So I have a classroom list. For our learning circles, for each one, we don't use the gen general online platform. We create a separate course that is just for the learning circles. So that way we create ourselves a group as well. So anytime either we launch something new or we've seen another course that's, that's come available through another platform, we throw a shout out to our uh, email lists from our groups and say, hey, if you're interested in this, this is what's coming up. Like we did that, there was a Python course that was being offered and they were offering, uh, it was the Python Essentials and they were offering a massively, massively discounted certification at the end if you got a certain percentage on the final exam on that. So we threw that out, we're like, hey, if anybody's interested, because you know, and then that way you're investing in your own future as well. It's not, I'm just taking a bunch of free courses and I'm getting certificates of completion, but I'm not really going beyond that. Like this actually led to a full certification. It was available and it was just a, hey, this is not something that we have on offer right now, but we know where it is. Some of you mentioned that you might, been in, might have been interested in that. So here's the avenue and how to pursue that. So we try our best. Obviously we can't keep up with everything that's being offered everywhere all the time, um, but we definitely do try. And if people come to us with questions, we'll go out and we'll do the research and we'll bring it back to them as well. Uh, you started to touch on this a little. Um, costs. Cisco is a for-profit company. Their, their platforms are designed for the long run to get you to pay for their exams and pay for their equipment and pay for their software. What are the costs to your participants and to the TPL to be on this platform and to be uh, using these courses? Um, as far as our participants in branches, there is zero cost to them. So they create the account through us for free. They have access to the content through us for free. So there's no, so it, in adhering to public library um, standards, it is all available for free. Um, as for the library itself and its costs, I do not know. I couldn't tell you. I know that there is a partnership agreement. I know, um, that it's at a very high level. I believe that Cisco offered it to the libraries for free, but I'm not 100% certain, so I really I couldn't say. I can tell you though, that by joining this platform and becoming a networking academy, we are the first public library in Canada to become a, network, a Cisco networking academy. <laughs> well, we're, we're also the biggest public library system in Canada, so you know, <laughs> there's, there's that as well. <laughs> Any other questions? Okay. All right, thank, thank you. you.